Welcome to Theories and Problems in Visual Art. This is Lecture 17 in the History Series on Hegel and his ideas about history and art. I'm only going to talk about two ideas of Hegel's, the diachronic and the synchronic coherence of art, which I'll define one after the other, uh, and then a little bit about criticisms of Hegel and attempts to escape from Hegel. So Hegel is an early 19th century German philosopher um, his primary concern wasn't art. He didn't actually care much for visual art. He didn't care especially for it. He didn't see many works in the original. He was interested in large systems uh, that also worked in history, that included aesthetics and art history, among other many other fields. Um, but among these different ideas, just two have been especially important for art history. First is the claim that art moves forward through time in accordance with certain specifiable laws, and second, the claim that at any given time all the arts of a culture, of a given culture, are in harmony with each other. So the first of these claims, that art moves forward in accord with specifiable laws, is usually called diachronic claim, meaning that it concerns development in time, and the second claim, that at any given time all the arts of a culture are in harmony, is usually called synchronic because it concerns the relation between parts of a culture at any given time. So even here, before I've even started the exposition, I'm departing from Hegel, because um, as is the case with uh, Clement Greenberg and some earlier history lectures, often with Hegel, what matters is the understanding people have of him, even if they haven't read his texts. Um, and these words, diachronic and synchronic, for example, aren't even his. Um, so we're talking about uh, questions of the um, reception and understanding uh, of Hegel, even if they are distorted or reduced. So the first theme, diachronic coherence of the arts. So Hegel wrote a philosophy of history. The title is, the, is in German on the left-hand page there um, in his collected works. In Hegel's philosophy, history in general, talking about um, all of culture um, um, outside of visual arts, um, History is governed by the movement of spirit or idea. In German, the word he uses is Geist. Um, and this word Geist occurs in several compound forms. Weltgeist is a, is a word that's not common in English, means world spirit. Volksgeist, you sometimes hear in English, means national spirit. Zeitgeist is, is an English word, uh, doesn't even have to be italicized. Uh, and it means roughly spirit of the age. Spirit obviously doesn't mean soul. It is a little closer to idea even than spirit in English, uh, but that's the vocabulary that we have. So Hegel has um, a famous um, proposition about the three stages uh, of arts, not just visual arts again, but three stages of art um, as they progress in accord with the world spirit. And the first of these stages is symbolic. In that stage, um, no art is up to the task of really representing the spirit of the world, the Weltgeist. So people choose natural objects more or less at random and they make them into symbols. Hegel says, quote, the early artistic pantheism of the East is a good example uh, because people sometimes choose, quote, the most worthless objects and invest them with tremendous spiritual significance. Um, when he talks about the artistic uh, pantheism, he may have been thinking of things like uh, Hindu symbols like uh, the elephant god Ganesha. Symbolic artists, Hegel says, um, fumbled around trying to express themselves without being able to create forms that would harmonize with the content that they had in mind. The second stage he calls classical. I'm exemplifying these with, uh, with visual art. The second stage is the classical in which people, like the Greeks and Romans, took the human form as the vehicle to help them express their idea, and they invested the human form with all the aspects of the Weltgeist, the world spirit. So in that way, Greek gods all had human shape, and they expressed the sum total of the Greeks' ideas about religion. The third and last stage in Hegel's philosophy of history is the Romantic stage. Uh, that's when natural forms are once again chosen to represent the spirit of the world. But in this case, natural forms means the kind of form that Hegel himself was used to in his own generation, early 19th century art, especially romantic art. Hegel says this may seem like a reversion to the primitive symbolic stage, but what romantic art expresses is not outward symbols, 
but inwardness. Innerlichkeit is a very important uh, term in German uh, art criticism and cultural theory, inwardness. And subjective self-awareness is what's being expressed in a landscape like this. So it's not about the, a stormy sky out in the world, it's about the storm in you. <laughs> the Weltgeist is then supposedly at last free to take whatever form that it needs to. So it's, uh, it's easy to see how this triad, symbolic, classical, and romantic, can also be used to explain religion because it's, uh, it's all the arts, all the aspects of culture that Hegel is attempting to explain. In terms of religion, you could say first there were animal gods, and then there were human ones, and now we have the incorporeal Christian god. That would be a sequence that Hegel had in mind as an example um, of his uh, sequence. Um, there's a famous example in this philosophy of history in which he names the Sphinx as a transitional figure between symbolic and classical art, between the first stage and the second stage. Because it was, so it was half animal, that is half simple, and half human, that is half classical, it's a, it's a kind of an unforgettable example of the theory. It also, though, begs the question of what the transition from classical to romantic would look like. That would be something which is half human, half landscape, half nature, half, half human form, half natural form. Anyway, that's a, that's a missing example, I suppose. So art historians haven't taken this literally. It's not something that's used in art history. But it's proven almost impossible not to think of art as progressing through time in some determinate fashion. And of all the theorists of art history, Hegel has the cleanest analysis, the easiest to remember. Um, his account has diachronic coherence. That is to say, it, it hangs together as a story through, that takes place through time. In his view, art progresses. Progression is the, is the uh, great word of the, of, the, of, of the later 19th century that was um, used to describe uh, industrialization and prog economic progress. Um, in Hegel's sense, uh, though, the spirit actually moves forward rather than simply just changing or wandering the way that we might think. Uh, that would be a more postmodern way of thinking of things. Hegel's sequences are what are called meliorist. Uh, meliorist uh, history is one that actually improves because better expressions of the Weltgeist are to be desired over less accurate ones because the idea is to try to express um, the world spirit um, as fully as possible in art, in religion, in law, in economics, everything in every aspect of culture. The second really influential idea in Hegel is the synchronic coherence of the arts. So synchronic is the connection within a given time, in a given moment of time, rather than through time. And here, there's another term which has become very common and is, and is basically just used in English uh, informally all the time, the zeitgeist. The idea in Hegel is that at any given time in history, all the products of a culture should be linked uh, by their identical relation to the zeitgeist, the spirit or the idea of the time. So 1970s architecture, design, fashion, they should all show the same zeitgeist. And the same principle applies to law, politics, economic, business, everything else in the 1970s. You could see from this kind of example just how pervasive this idea of Hegel's is. It seems to make good sense. And even though the example I chose there, the three examples I chose there, two of them fit very well together, one of them a little bit less so, but a lot of uh, historians and art historians have more or less intuitively taken it as their task when they're talking about a given period or a given year, a given decade, to try to see the harmonies between the different manifestations of culture. And that is the influence of Hegel, uh, the idea that they really all should hang together. This is an illustration of the so-called Venus figurines, like the most famous one is right in the center, the Venus of Willendorf. These are actually made over tens of thousands of years and across hundreds of miles um, of, of uh, space in, in Europe by people who presumably were largely unrelated to each other. But the influence of Hegel is partly responsible for the idea that there is such a thing as quote unquote Venus figurines. Even though when you look at these, only a few of them look like they might actually belong together. Um, but it's a, it's a sign of how strong his uh, thinking is that even in a field like this where we're talking about cultures that are, are separated by so vast differences in time and space, um, they still appeal to people's sense of unity and, and coherence within a given time. This isn't really a style or a movement or a culture, um, but it's a persistent desire of historians to think so. <laughs>
this idea of the zeitgeist, the spirit of the time, um, has found its way into lots of other fields in sociology and others. There, there are studies of the spirit of the time. Um, this is a zeitgeist model from uh, zeitgeist segmentation model, it says at the bottom, from Trends Observer uh, from 2017. It's just a website that I found while I was searching for graphics for this, but it turns out that this has been uh, in a way quantified. The idea here is that you go around the circle from the top, um, starting at the zero, going around counterclockwise, um, you go from traditional perspectives to avant-garde perspectives. So you, starting from, starting from uh, the top, going counterclockwise, crisis, fear, nostalgia, individualism, they would be conservative trends that are um, driven by an interest in tradition or, or, or a fear of the new. And as you go around, you come around to like where three o'clock or so, mobility, acceptance, time, technology, innovation, non-gender, which is in the opinion of the people who made this particular um, circle, that's a way of measuring um, in sociology um, the, uh, the zeitgeist, that is the connection between people who are traditionalists and people who are avant-garde. So just as an example of the really far-flung um, influence of Hegel. So art historians no longer study the zeitgeist directly. There aren't any <clears throat> papers or conferences or, or books on the zeitgeist of such and such a time. But there are many studies that assume that there is some coherence and uh, there, there are no studies that I know of, of any period, style, time, year, and so on in art history uh, that don't try to make a coherent story out of all the disparate parts of the culture. In art history, this was, um, this was done at several different times in a kind of explicit way. This is a book which is widely as assigned to um, art history students in upper level classes. Uh, because it was a kind of a groundbreaking book at the time where the author, uh, Michael Baxadal, tries to make connections between all sorts of things in 15th century Italy, um, connecting paintings like the one you see here to things that seem to have nothing to do with that, like for example, a treatise on how to calculate the volume of wine barrels. Um, the idea is that everything there um, in that culture at that time belongs together. Anything that didn't seem to belong together with these others would be a puzzle to someone like this author and as it remains for most art historians. So there are a number of uh, criticisms of Hegel. I'll just mention a few of them. First of all, there are people who have said, well, it's very conceptual. Um, uh, Hegel was an extremely abstract thinker, uh, and maybe it's important to look at empirical models, in other words, uh, real data, uh, and see how irregular history actually is. Uh, the art historian E.H. Gombrich uh, proposed a model um, based on the unpredictable sequence of fashion. He wrote an essay called The Logic of Vanity Fair, which is collected in this book, if you wanted to look it up. It's an attempt to study uh, fashion, fashion style and taste, and to take discrete, empirical, practical lessons from what happens in fashion and try to use them to understand um, change through time in, uh, in art history and also coherence within a given time in art history. What Gombrich was doing in this was trying to get away from what he thought of as German philosophic ideas because he came out of the German speaking tradition and he was well aware of the fact that uh, of Hegel's influence and of the fact that um, art historians uh, who were in his generation and before uh, were very much enthralled to this idea that you could create large-scale narratives moving continuously and fluidly through time according to the, the progression of the world spirit and that you could create these um, synthetic studies of, uh, of uh, periods which would show how the spirit was suffusing everything. And in place of that, he wanted to put something that was very attentive to very um, discrete and almost uh, and often illogical kinds of changes. In history of science, there have also been um, critiques of Hegel um, one of these historian of science who, who uh, launched a critique like that is Karl Popper, who was Gombrich's friend and also the inspiration for that essay, Logic of Vanity Fair. Karl Popper was a, was a, um, a philosopher who was interested in arguing against various forms of, of um, German philosophy uh, and their influence on um, uh, movements like National Socialism. So it was political. He had political interests, uh, which Gombrich took over to art history. Um, a couple of others who did exclusively history of science um, were Paul Feyerabend and Thomas Kuhn. Uh, 
So Thomas Kuhn is the one I have here in three different editions of his most famous um, book. So Kuhn was interested in the way that science changes. So the way they changed over from like um, from Ptolemy to Copernicus to um, you know to, to Newton and from Newton to Einstein and so on, how that kind of change happened. Um, and this idea of the structure of scientific revolutions is that science does move continuously through time in a way that I suppose could be thought of as, as um, compatible with Hegel's ideas, but that when there are scientific revolutions, the whole conversation changes in largely unpredictable, radical, and fundamental ways, and science just goes off in another direction. The expression paradigm shifts has been used to describe this. It's not actually a term that, that Kuhn uses in this book, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an evocative way of thinking of what Kuhn is talking about. So this is kind of uh, change through time, in this case in science, is not at all something that happens according to some spirit, some geist. Gombrich also wrote uh, this um, large pamphlet or thin book, In Search of Cultural History, which is all about problems with Hegel's zeitgeist, with the synchronic aspect of his theory. Gombrich illustrates Hegel's idea uh, that all the parts of culture are connected with uh, the metaphor of a wagon wheel. So on the cover of his book, you see that here. It's meant to be an old-fashioned wagon wheel, and the hub, which has a question mark, uh, is the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. It, it just has a question mark because this is the, the book designer's idea for a cover, but um, in the model that Gombrich talks about in the book, the hub is the zeitgeist, it's not a question mark. Um, and around it are all the parts of culture that harmonize with it. So the, at the, on the hub, or in between the spokes, um, you might be able to make out art, religion, constitutions, morality, law, customs, technology, and so on. That's the idea uh, in Hegel, as it's visualized by Gombrich. Gombrich proposes that we break the spokes off the wheel by accepting the fact that not all parts of a culture fit together. Perfectly reasonable thing to do. Um, and uh, there are plenty of examples uh, any, anywhere you look within art history of parts of a culture, parts of artistic practice that don't fit with each other, but it continues to really bother um, people who write about art when they encounter things that don't seem to fit. So Hegel isn't an easy uh, person to figure out how to critique, because on the one hand, those ideas like of the Sphinx and that kind of thing are, are, are you know, not useful, easy to understand what's wrong with them. But the, the, the broader ideas, the more abstract ideas, the idea that there's a zeitgeist, the idea of diachronic movement through time, they're really insidious. They're very, they're very persistent. Um, you would think you could just you know, stop assuming that art progresses and say, okay, I'm not gonna use that word progresses. I'm not gonna think of art moving in one direction through time or moving continuously from one period to another. I'm just gonna stop thinking that everything, every kind of art that I see made this year anywhere in the world somehow fits to a central spirit because that's ridiculous. It turns out you can say that, but you can't write it or teach that way and you can barely learn that way because the resulting lecture or book would sound incoherent. The story that I tell about art will seem incomplete until I demonstrate a sequence of practices, a diaconic coherence, no matter how I do it, using anyone's theory. And the story that I tell is going to seem incomplete or wrong until I can demonstrate that all the different um, aspects of art, examples of art that I'm talking about, are somehow linked, like in a wagon wheel, by this principle of synchronic coherence. They're very difficult problems, and it's been, what's it been, 200 years um, since um, Hegel, and uh, he's, still not, um, he's still not someone that people have solved. Yeah, that's a little depressing, but that's the way Hegel is. Even if you don't read him, you're still following him.